Welcome to the Safety Share, a webinar series brought to you by CIM Magazine and the CIM Health and Safety Society. I am your organizer, Michelle Beacom, Managing Editor of CIM Magazine. Today's presentation is Serious Injury and Fatality Prevention 2. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you dialed in or if you joined by computer audio, make sure you've chosen the computer audio button. If you dialed in on by your phone, make sure you've chosen the phone button. If you have any questions during the Q&A or any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. The questions will be held until the very end. Know that we will have some poll questions during the presentation, so pay attention. And now I'm going to introduce Nelson. Uh, I'm very happy to have Nelson Bondarchuk as one of our hosts. He's here to help us uh, make this series happen. Nelson is treasurer for CIM's Health and Safety Society and vice president for health and safety at Torx Gold Resources. Welcome, Nelson. Thanks, Michelle, and, and hello to everybody today on the call. And uh, thanks to our, to our guest uh, speakers and guest hosts for joining us today. Um, today is a uh, sequel to an episode we did last year around uh, serious injury, injury and fatality prevention. Um, there was a study group that was brought together by DSS Plus, um, and they've published recently published their findings or are about to publish some of their findings, and we're going to be discussing that today. And so, you know, this episode of the Safety Share, we're really going to talk about global mining, serious injury fatality, and what the study group found, what they got up to over the last year, um, and we'll include uh, an update at the end on on findings to date through the the Q and A. So the study group represents a cross section of the global mining industry. Uh, there's been some serious collaboration that's happened last year. I'm excited to hear about what they've been up to. Um, and really the, the purpose of it was to advance the understanding of the foundations and fundamental concepts around SIF causation and prevention, of course. Uh, and you know, everybody on the panel today are seasoned professionals with, I'm gonna say well over a century of experience when you add it all up in health, safety, training, environment, risk management. Um, and so without further ado, I also brought a partner in crime today from the Health and Safety Society, John Treen, who's the president of Automate, Automate Mining. Um, and again, another seasoned professional joining us today. He'll be shouldering some of the effort this year from the HSS perspective, and you may see him in, in some of the episodes, uh, and I'll be in participation, but He's going to be taking on some of that uh, burden. It's not a big burden, but uh, he'll be taking over some of the duties there this year. And uh, our one of our panelists today, Michael Heistron, from he's a principal from DSS Plus. I'm going to run through these uh, quickly just so we can get into the discussion. Don Martin was another principal from DSS Plus. These two gentlemen helped uh, form the study group and, and facilitated it. Then we have two participants. Last year we had somebody from tech. This year we've got Kelly Kiris, uh, HSER manager, capital projects and exploration from Ballet Base Metals. And Mike Duffy joins us today as well. He's the manager of health, safety, and training at Nevada Gold Mines. So without further ado, we'll get into the good part of the conversation. John, over to you to guest host today and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Nelson. And, you know, I also want to thank the panel just for coming together and sharing, uh, you know, what they've learned so far. Uh, and just as importantly, if not more importantly, thank the enti entire study team. You know, what that group is doing, what they're going to bring to the industry is very beneficial. And, and thanks to the companies that support you in those efforts. And, I mean, I think everybody's interested to see what's coming out of this study, what's the findings been. And so, and so Don, maybe I'll start with you. Could, could you just give us a quick update on, on what we found or what you found so far through the study group? Oh, sure. And, and thank you, John. And again, thank you uh, to you and uh, uh, CIM Magazine for inviting us to participate and also to the uh, to the seven members of our study group who so openly provided uh, the information that we're sharing today. But, you know, if I could just start off with uh, talking about the maybe the top four preliminary like headline findings that are coming out of the study. 
and and there and there are a lot more than these than these four but let's talk about these four uh to start with uh number one getting out in the field and doing on the ground verifications of critical controls is an absolute game changer in the area of preventing SIS. Uh, getting out on the ground and approaching uh, crews and creating a meaningful conversation about the SIF risk they're facing and their understanding of the critical controls necessary to protect themselves and each other. An absolute game changer when it's done well. Uh, the second big thing is that we've landed on five uh, leading SIF indicators. We we uh, we tested these metrics. Uh, we've determined that they are uh, valid and they are reliable, and we'll be advocating a position that they take a more prominent role. Uh, maybe even replacing some of the traditional uh, lagging indicators that we're used to. And we'll, we'll talk more about what those five leading uh, SIF indicators are. Uh, next big thing is that, that we uh, became convinced that uh, executive level sponsorship of an SIF prevention effort is essential to the success of that effort that when executives are the owners of SIF prevention and when they demonstrate visible behaviors in front of others that indicate their interest in the subject and their commitment uh, to protecting people. It makes a huge difference towards the successful outcomes of an SIF prevention program. And then uh, probably the last big thing is we, we uh, studied uh, best practices that were shared among companies. We also identified uh, what we would call some missing practices uh, that could be strengthened. And probably the top two that, that stood out was uh, getting uh, a, a better handle on how we go about uh, contractor SIF management, and then also how we can improve our accident investigation quality and effectiveness. So getting away from uh, the traditional root cause analysis approach and getting away from uh, blaming the worker and fixing the worker and looking for uh, maybe what we'll call a causal learning model that, that pushes us further upstream to understand how the SIF risk situations get set up in the first place. So I'll stop there uh, with those top four uh, preliminary uh, headlines. And then as, as, the, as the day goes on, we'll spend a bit more time uh, uh, talking about those. Thanks, Don. And I mean, those are four great, like you said, preliminary ones, and I'm sure there's more in the study, um, which are all important. What you're doing today and what we're doing with CIM to share this webinar is going to be very useful. But what else could be done or how are your other thoughts on how you're going to share this with the industry as a whole so that the true value of what's found can be shared with the industry? And maybe for that, Michael, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, yeah, we. Um, it's important to note that this SIF study group has been um, operating now for uh, over a year, um, and we've had a lot of interest in the group. Um, uh, specifically, um, uh, we've done at least uh, two webinars uh, with with uh, CIM in the past. CIM in the past. Uh, we also uh, Michael Duffy joined me in a presentation at the CIM conference uh, in Montreal uh, earlier last year. Uh, we've spoken to the MSRT, and um, so there's been a lot of interest and excitement. We've also briefed a number of ex executive organizations, and we've also had a, a pretty interesting global reach. So uh, upcoming on the docket, um, we will be presenting at the CIM conference in Vancouver coming up in May. We're going to do both a short course, and then we're going to do a related content. I think, Nelson, that'll be Monday afternoon, where there's going to be a very specific SIF track. And so we'll be fleshing out uh, in more detail the findings, especially the, the SIF metrics. Um, coming off of that, we're going to be presenting again to the MSRT. And I think a number of the members of the study group have asked us to speak uh, to MAC. So we'll be speaking to them. Um, there has been some interest in the U.S. side of the house. And so National Mining Association, along with a number of the um, state mining associations, and we're looking at speaking engagements and groups to get the word out that on the U.S. side of the house. Uh, Don and I will be presenting also on the global front outside of North America to Euro Mines in April in Belgium. 
So we've already done a preliminary presentation to them and they've asked us to come out and, and speak to, to that organization to give a European flair. And um, we're also starting to speak with ICMM as well. So it's been a pretty broad based uh, opportunity from a speaking engagements. The group will be publishing the results uh, of this study. So it is open up to the industry. Um, we are uh, considering a number of uh, both peer reviewed journals as well as a number of periodicals. And in fact, if anybody had some ideas of where they'd like it to be seen published, uh, uh, please feel free to enter some names uh, of some journals or periodicals in the chat, and we'll be happy to consider that as a study group. Well, th thanks, Michael. I didn't realize how you know how vast your communication plan was for this, but, but that's excellent. And, you know, it's important that we get these studies that take up place out to the industry so people can learn from it and, and how it applies to their operations or how they can apply it to their operation. And maybe maybe with that thought, maybe Kelly, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, you know, with your history, with the work you're doing at Valley, your involvement in the study group. What were some of the interesting findings you found uh, through through this investigation or through this study group? Yeah, thanks, John. So expanding a little bit on what Don's insight was related to critical control verification. I mean, the group, uh, almost unanimously uh, recognized the importance of leaders spending time in the field. However, it was also unanimous that mm -hmm. the real impact comes when this time is dedicated to verifying the effectiveness of controls. Uh, this, again, ensures that the final barrier between the frontline workers and potential risks are firmly in place, right? Uh, another interesting um, observation from the group was that almost most of the participants were not newcomers to the fatality uh, prevention or serious injury prevention, prevention programs, but many of them had not encountered commonly used metrics beyond inside uh, incident rates uh, that to, to drive the, the prevention efforts of SIF. So basically, this is a strategy that most of us are very keen to, to have as, a, uh, as outcomes from this group, right? And being broadly advertised uh, with the industry in some potential uh, uh, channels, just like this one we have today. Great, thanks. Thanks, Hilly, appreciate that. Um, you know, Michael, you were with Nevada Gold Mines. You've got some of the same experience. You brought that to the team um, through the study group. Maybe from you, what, what were some of the the findings that you found interesting, or or maybe even some things that were were under the radar that really popped out to you? If you want to share your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, thanks, John. You know, Kelly and I had the pleasure of working together at Ballet, so uh, we have similar learnings and just. Coming, coming to Nevada Gold Mines, which of course is a, a joint venture between Barrick and Newmont. And so you, you have both of their cultures coming into place. And what the learnings are is certainly picking up on Kelly's first point. It's people in the field, but it's ensuring that people are in the field for the right purpose. You know, there's the, the frontline supervisor has the, one of, if not the hardest job on the mine site. And, you know, they're, they're being driven from a production standpoint and remember you have to be safe. So we're flipping that to safe production versus producing safely. And we, we're getting the the leadership out into the field, that frontline leadership, and, and asking the questions, you know, engaging that frontline workforce and ensuring the controls are in place. Because the one thing we know is whether it's surface, underground, or processing, things can go things can go awry very quickly. So that's that's a really big learning and, and we're really working hard to put that into place and, and focusing on fatal risks, you know, identifying what the quote unquote big hitters are, and then really using that data to to drive better controls in 
in those areas. Uh, th thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. You know, I like the comment you made about you know in the field asking the right questions. And one of the things for me, I truly support you know the belief that the supervisor is the key to make all this happen. They're the ones that are 24/7 in the field. And so, as leadership in the field, one of the things I think is asking the right questions. But if not even more importantly is coaching the supervisors on their ability to ask the right questions, right? If if you think about leadership and in the field and the percentage of time they'll actually interact with employees, it's a very small percentage. But if they can spend their time coaching the supervisors on how to have those discussions, how to ask those questions, how to bring the discussions around SIF to the forefront, that 24-7 exposure to prevention is going to be improved dramatically. And so I think your points are 100% on the mark, and I thank you for that, Tim. You know, maybe it's a good time now, Nelson, just to pop into a into a poll. Yeah, Michelle, if we could get that slide up there. Don, do you mind just uh, sure leaving this one out for the crowd? So here here's a situation that we'll pose to the group, and we'd like you to uh, study this situation and evaluate it to determine does this situation have SIF potential? Situation. There's a 136 kilogram, 300 pound steam valve that got dropped from a suspended height of 10 meters. And, and it got dropped because the sling and the wire rope sheared. The valve fell harmlessly to the ground, scattering dirt and rocks, uh, small rocks upon impact. Fortunately, nobody was inside the lifting exclusion zone because it had been well delineated by barricade tape and signs. Several workers were two meters outside the barricaded area and they were wearing safety helmets, eye protection and other standard work clothing. So you have three choices. Yes, this situation should be classified as SI potential. No, this situation should not be classified as SI potential or I need more information to make an accurate classification. All right, folks, for those of you on the call in the audience, please uh, cast your votes. It's an interesting one. I hope it, it causes a little bit of a, a stir. We are at about... Seventy percent voted. We'll give it another five seconds, Michelle. Okay, let's call that. See how our results look. So it looks like you have over half folks said yes, should be classified. Twenty-four percent no, and then another twenty percent, give or take, said need more information. Comments done. Yeah, this is a, this is very interesting because it's very highly reflective of what happened in our study group uh, conversations. Yeah. About half of the group said, yes, this has SI potential. And the other half was either no, it does not, or I don't have enough information to make a to make an accurate determination. And uh, so for us, it's very interesting. And I will say that it did consume a lot of debate and discussion time in the group because what we saw, what we figured was that we had to get this uh, discussion right, come up with really good, clear, concise decision logic rules uh, that are calibrated and so that they are uh, consistent and repeatable because this concept of SIF potential forms the basis for a couple of our SIF metrics. Now, at the end of this, uh, uh, DSS has carved out a position uh, based on our, on our evidence and experience with lots of other clients around the world that SIF potential does exist even when all of the mitigation controls on the right-hand side of a bow tie perform like you wanted them to. So in this case, the barricade tape was up, the signs were up, and nobody was inside the, barri the, the barricaded zone. Uh, the fact is that there was a, a material unwanted event that occurred, and that was a 300-pound object fell to the ground because a, a wire rope sheared, 
And that's something that you never want to have happen. So so our, our, our decision logic would say, yes, we would classify that as SIF potential because the situation that you did not want to have happen, a dropped object, did in fact happen. The mitigation controls did what, what you wanted them to do, kept workers out of the, the, the barricaded area, but the event still warrants a classification of SIF potential and resulting special handling. So that, that's the DSS carve out position. And I'll invite, uh, you know, Michael and Kelly, if they'll have any other uh, additional uh, comments on that. I'll let Kelly start. <laughs> Yeah, I think that you expanded uh, well there. I wouldn't have any additions. So I agree, Don. The the it's really a new way of thinking for a lot of people to look at the the event and use you know you 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 reference bow tie, which I think is a good. It's a good visual uh, representation here. And we want to ensure we stay on that left side of the bow tie. And once you have the event, you know, then you're relying on things that happen in the past, uh, that happen post event to limit the damage. So, you know, I, I think if we can get that thought process out into into the workforce, into our uh, you know uh, uh, our peer companies, that's where the focus needs to be. Prevent the event that uh, material unwanted event from actually happening, because that's where we have the most control. Otherwise, it's it, it's it's limiting damage, and. Uh, you know, I, I think we all know that barricade tape and signs are uh, very passive controls. Now, if you had hard barricades up, we, we could be looking at a, a, at a different story. But ultimately, it's preventing the material unwanted event. Exactly. It's, I, I just have one comment there. It's about being curious too, right? Like from my team, we're always asking those questions. We'll have a we'll have a high potential, like a high high potential severity event, and we'll say to ourselves, "Well, could it have been worse?" Okay, yes, but we're always happy when we see the controls work. And and I've kind of tweaked my team up to be like, "Well, we're but what if this happened? And what if that happened? Like that could have been a really really bad day." And so I think that that curiosity is really the spark there, right? Is what you folks are getting at, which is interesting. Thanks, Excellent. Thanks for so great participation. Yeah. For the inputs. I mean, I, I would just add to that. I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall for that discussion in this <laughs> in the study group on the two thousand fifty. And, and I mean, I, I honestly think that's one of the gaps in our industry now, right? We're so busy, we're in so many meetings, having that time to expand on discussions, take the learning from them, share, you know, honest opinions back and forth. It's a great opportunity to to help guide the judgment on what is actually the right thing to do. And and so, you know, to Mike's point. When you create those learnings and you get those discussions, how do you bring that back and share it? It's just a, it's just a perfect perfect thing. Um, maybe maybe I'll move on to the next one and I'll I'll start off with uh, leading into Don. He mentioned something about you know SIF leading indicators and measurements. I fortunately read a book, Measure What Matters, not too long ago. <laughs> give, give a shout out to one of my friends, uh, Andrew Watson, who recommended it, but. You know, this is one of the things we talk about in the industry. When we get measures, it gets done, and there's lots of important measurements that take place. I think in the mining industry, in many industries, safety is probably one that uses use leading indicators even more than others do. Um, but maybe thinking about SIF and what the study group came up with, and, and Don, I'll go to you just to prepare you for it. If we look at metrics, what did the study group say about metrics, whether they be leading or lagging, um, and any findings if you could share? Great. Well, thanks, John. And, and I, I love that book. I'm so glad you showed that because I was just thinking <laughs> these five metrics that, that we that we built and agreed on, they actually do matter. And, and, and who do they matter to? They matter to the miners out in the field. 
So, so the very first one, and we'll talk more about these. Uh, number one is SIF actual. So an actual fatality, an actual uh, life altering event. That is the absolute bottom line thing that we're trying to prevent. So that's the first metric, SIF actuals. The second one connects back to that uh, uh, poll question that we just finished. How many SIF potentials have occurred over a period of time at a site or a business unit? And so that's why getting that definition and the decision logic for that so, uh, so calibrated is very important. How many SIF potentials occurred? The good news for most companies is that most organizations have very few SIF actuals, but they have a lot of SIF potentials. The SIF potentials, and you hit it right on the head uh, when you asked the question about the curiosity about the if, what else could happen, what, is that those SIF potentials are literally one if away, one change circumstance away from being a very different outcome. That's why they're so important to collect. That's why they're so important to study. Now, if you take both the SIF actuals and SIF potentials together, that leads you to your third metric, which is what we'll call SIF vulnerability index. So you can calculate those two events together and, and do a simple math equation of dividing by your denominator is the number of recordable injuries, let's say. And that and that fraction, you can express that as a percent, and it expresses a quantitative view of what your vulnerability is to experiencing an actual SIF event. So for easy arithmetic, if you had 100 recordable injuries and you looked at and, and you looked at every single one of them and 25 of them, we're one if away from being an SIF outcome, 25 over 100 is 25%. Very simple calculation, but I will tell you that it is an executive level attention grabber because most of the time, most executives, that's the first time they've ever had a quantified view of what their vulnerability is to experiencing an SIF event. So that's our third metric. The, the fourth metric is a, a, a corrective and preventive action, kappa, kappa closure rate on, uh, on kappas that related to SIF actuals and SIF potentials. So the assumption being that when an SIF actual or a potential occur, you do some type of a causal evaluation or root cause investigation. You come up with uh, corrective and preventive actions, kappa. How do you track those to completion? So this percent closure rate, timely closure, and then following through to determine that it solved the problem, that is a very meaningful metric as well. And then the last big one is circling back to our opening conversation on going out in the field and conducting field verifications of critical controls. When you do this in a, in a very uh, prescribed manner, you collect a lot of data and out of that data, you can calculate what percent of the time are my people in the field protected from SIF harm because the SIF critical controls are in place and performing. So that, that is a very powerful leading metric and that, that would be our, our number five uh, recommendation. So I'll stop there. Those, those are the five ones that, that we debated, tested, tried, and, and decided that those were the five that we want to promote forward uh, to, to the uh, mining community. Thank, thanks, Don. And very interesting, you know, as you go through the five and the sequence of them, you know, a little bit of lagging as you're talking about the actuals that occur, and then you get into a little bit more leading. Then you get into closure, which I think is, you know, one of the things, are these things actually getting taken care of? Is it getting prevented? And then the last one, I, I'm really, I'm really impressed and intrigued by the other one around percent protected from SIF in, in the field, which it's just, it's something and a new way to think about things. Um, but I guess with that same thing, it's a new way to think about things and it's five new metrics. Um, you know, what is the interest in actually adding these new metrics into the industry? Like, what do you think the resolve will be from, from industry? And, and Michael, maybe I'll turn it over to you on some of, some of your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably a, the best understatement I've heard in a while. Um, 
there is, uh, in the sessions that we have uh, delivered, both in large group uh, sessions like this and one-on-one and -on -one with, with organizational senior leadership teams, this is probably the hot, hottest topic uh, and, and the most interest. Uh, and, and specifically that polling question about what some organizations describe as, oh, do we fail safely? Is that high potential, yes or no? A lot of passionate discussion around that. Um, I think the the key that we're going to be looking for is this. We this this one topic around SIF metrics and the ones that Don just described. This is, will definitely be a paper that will come out uh, of this SIF study group, and there obviously will be a lot more information uh, that comes out of that. What we're going to look for from the industry, and I'm going to say specifically the mining industry, is really good feedback on the work that this SIF study group has provided. Um, as a group, we're not saying that companies need to adopt these metrics specifically. We think it's a good idea if they do, um, but we what we do ad advocate for is having a set of metrics that everyone in the industry can understand and align with so we can share lessons learned and activities and, and opportunities for preventing SIF uh, events and we can only do that with a common language and a common set of metrics so what you do inside your company is fine uh, but we're really going to look for feedback uh, from the members uh, of the mining community uh, to share with us their thoughts and, and we can we can further fine-tune as necessary but that's going to be a, an important aspect as an industry as we continue to move forward and making advances in um, SIP prevention. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. And I mean, I think, you know, you've got to write, putting those out, the right things and the right metrics to measure to change, you know, change performance and improve safety are critical. I'll, I'll just leave with my favorite quote from the book that I read. And it really, the quote said, not everything that you measure matters. Getting back to the point, making sure you measure the right thing. So not everything you measure matters, but also everything that matters cannot be measured. So not everything that matters can be measured. And so having a pulse, getting in the field, understanding things. So I think the, the what you've talked about in those five KPIs or five metrics are really, really great. Um, maybe now we'll turn it back to a little bit more for practical and for the industry. Um, and for this one, Mike, I'll start with you. And Nevada Gold Mines, your time at Valley previously, or just from you've been in the industry, like, what do you think the things that came out of the SIF study that the mining companies can do can do differently or can improve from from what you know what you've learned from being part of this study team? Yeah, that's that's a great question, John. The so what I've seen and and some of the other peer companies that are in the study, you know, I've taken a few things away from from them and and you know we focus a lot on uh, non-SIF incidents and we, we put a lot of energy into the investigation process and, and you know, understanding the causes and, and one of our peer companies basically said we were looking at all of these, these incidents and because we put so much emphasis on these, uh, I'll say minor incidents, non-SIS potential incidents, we weren't focusing on the SIF potential incidents. A and going back to, to the statement that Don made, we don't have a lot of SIF actual, so we have to use the SIF potentials to gather the learnings. But when you're focused up here, move my hand, up here, you're not seeing what's going on down here. And, and so we really have to drive that focus. And, and, and that's, that's what, what I've seen and, and that's what I'm, I'm bringing with me to Nevada Gold Mines and really focusing in and getting real strong investigation completed on SIP potential and the unfortunate SIF actuals that you, that you have, and really getting corrective and preventive action out of that, and then tracking those to closure and effectiveness. So that's that's key for 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 me. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll 
I'll let Kelly add into that. Yeah, sure. So technically, when we look into the SIF prevention, as I just said before, most of this group, we didn't have, let's say, newcomers to, to this sort of program, right? So, but before I go to my answer and say what we would do differently, I would say, I, I would just try to bring a little bit of context here uh, for some sort of wave that we are having uh, in our industry, right? Especially in the base metals industry and mining in general, right? Because we are currently witnessing a notable turnover in the senior leadership among all of the group's participants of our, of our study group. And please don't take me wrong, this is cyclical just as, as the uh, commodities price, right? But there is also, the uh, in, in terms of, uh, this is the context we're living in, but we do agree that we need to secure a buy-in from the level of this uh, leadership that is being turned over from company to company these days. And it's definitely crucial that we, in order to have success in the SIF prevention, we, 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 we have this buying. So in terms of implementing metrics, because again, we do have metrics currently, uh, there is something that for me, it was a, a, a differential in terms of uh, uh, um, KPIs. I would say that the percentage of SIF risk or SIF vulnerability, we can call it both ways, uh, this can provide a tangible insight into the vulnerability of the operations we have and also offering a compelling indicator of the org of the organization's susceptibility, uh, right? Or vulnerability to actual SIF injuries. So this is basically uh, one of the indicators that I think would be a game changer. Uh, yeah, and that would be it. Thanks, Kelly. I appreciate that. And I mean, I, I think the experience that both of you bring from the, the real world and, and your sites is really important. You know, Mike, when you mentioned one of the things for me that stood out is you mentioned the word focus and medical aids. You know, uh, to me, there's two key parts, right? It's determining whether it is a SIP potential or not, which I think, you know, through discussions will happen, there might be some variations. I think the other issue that might be, you know, difficult is culturally, how do you accept that you're going to put a bigger focus on some incidents than on other incidents? And, and you know, people can understand, yes, we are, but the ones that don't get as big a focus because they're not SIF potentials, how do you communicate that and do that in the organizations? And, and it'd be interesting to see how different companies do that with their SIF prevention programs. Actually, speaking about company SIF prevention programs, Nelson, maybe I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I think we're ready for the second poll here. And... Uh... For those of you uh, still here in the audience, I know this is close to lunch hour, but I see there's a ton of people still online. So what's the status of your company's SIF prevention efforts? And we're just looking for some feedback from the audience on where they believe their companies stand. I'll drive the, the last part of this conversation as we wrap up the hour. <clears throat> Does your process mature and high functioning, or is SIP prevention not on your radar yet? Those are the two extremes. There are about 50% voted. Give it a couple more seconds here. Just while we're waiting for that, um, Michael at DSS, if you don't mind, when you folks publish these metrics, where will those uh, be available? Or I guess uh, that's gonna, the next step. Yeah, we, we have a, a meeting coming up um, in, in April where we're going to identify the uh, uh, periodicals uh, and uh, uh, journals that we're going to publish in. So there will be yeah. the, the ones that the mining industry is very familiar with. Uh, we haven't landed on anyone specifically yet, and we're still considering that as a group. Uh, so, like I said, if, if folks are interested in 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 seeing this data in any particular uh, journal or periodical, we're we're interested in your industry input. Okay. 
Well, here's here's what we got. We had about 65% of the respondents responded um, to the poll here. We've got about half saying processes in place and making progress, but we still have gaps. And then the other largest, which is a little surprising to me, 20% taking out, talking about SIP prevention and studying the possibilities versus just getting started. Okay, over to you, Don. Um, or sorry, over to you, John. <laughs> no problem. Thank, thanks, Nelson. Yeah, I mean, great survey question and reflecting on not just the answers, but your own company and the journey you're on because it gets back to and we'll talk you know in the next question about the dss plus bradley uh, bradley curve and going from independent to interdependent um but you know how do you do that how do you take your organization how do we take an industry to change it from you know just to focus on individuals to actually looking at the team atmosphere of it all to looking at how you're looking out for one another in the mind in today's actions but even in the future actions of what you do today is going to impact maybe somebody two three four years down the road how does that all come together to make it happen and you know michael i know dss plus and and the study group has done a lot of work on it so maybe just i'll turn it over to you for a bit of discussion if that's all right great uh thank you john yeah i think uh, a lot of folks on the call here today are are familiar with the dss plus bradley curve uh if for those of you who are not it is a model that organizations can use to understand the maturity of uh, their uh, culture and specifically their safety culture. So at the far left uh, of the curve, um, uh, recordable rates are higher um, and you're in the what we call the reactive stage. And as organizations continue to work on and improve their safety performance and, and work on their culture uh, through leadership and safety and other interventions, you, you continue to, to migrate the culture to the right your performance gets better. Next phase is dependent phase, um, then the independent phase, and then finally the interdependent phase. So what's important when you're looking at this model is that um, uh, it's, there's not a one size fits all. A a every organization's in different spots in, in the Bradley curve. And so what we see is different um, uh, activities and then different intervention strategies based on where you happen to sit in the Bradley curve at this point. So if you were in the reactive phase um, and you have a SIP incident, SIP actual, you, you may not even differentiate between uh, high potential or not. Uh, you have a SIP actual, we're gonna look at um, uh, finding the violator, we're gonna write work orders, we're really focused in the compliance mode. Um, and if you were in that area, your opportunity is to look at some of the things that organizations are doing in the, in, in the dependent world. So in other words, if you're in reactive today, you cannot operate, you're organizationally probably not ready to do some of the things that, that you would see in the interdependent phase. If you're in the, in, in the dependent area and like one of the, one of the options on the poll question is, uh, hey, we're, we're getting started, we're looking at, at uh, uh, our program, we're launching off the ground, you might have, uh, define uh, your SIF uh, uh, potential and actuals. You might have strong decision logic and decision trees. Uh, you might start quantifying your SIF risk organizationally. And then finally, if you're in the interdependent arena, uh, you might be taking a very sophisticated approach. So for example, for a new cop, uh, OPEX project, you are really focusing on intervention by design. So everything from the bid process to the engineering process, to the manufacturing process or production process. Um, even before you ever get operational and your EPC hands you the keys uh, to operate, you've really looked at and made SIP prevention an integral part of how you work and how you operate. So again, um, uh, we work with different organizations who are all over the map on the Bradley curve and it's important to tailor your activities organizationally to where you're at, so it's important to figure out where you're at, where you want to go, and have your interventions tied to what's going to make you uh, uh, enable you to get to progress in the next phase. Great, thanks, Michael. And maybe just before we wrap it up and go to the Q and A for the overall uh, webinar, I'll turn it over to the other three panelists. If there's anything you want to add, to, you know, to 
to the transition from reactive to interdependent or even just anything major from the study group you've been involved in you want to share i'll give you one last sort of moment to do before we go to q a so don anything from from your perspective oh sure i i'd just like to you know sort of re-emphasize this point that uh michael brought up around you know prevention through design uh, this is one of the most important things that executive leadership teams can push for and sponsor inside their organizations. And that is when you're looking at corrective and preventive actions, how many of them are in the upper part of the safety hierarchy of controls? You know, elimination, substitution, engineering. Uh, and how hard can we push to diligently explore uh, the top part of that triangle, because that, that, that's where prevention through design and inherent, inherently safer design solutions exist. The more of those we can put in place, the safer the work situations are for the people in the field. And so I'm, I'm a big proponent of executives being the ones to ask those questions and push the organization in that direction. Great, Don. Great point. And thanks. Uh, Kelly, anything you'd like to yeah. add? Yeah. So when when I look, it, it's interesting when we look into the poll results, right? Because we do have companies that are yet in the first steps of the SIF prevention. And this group has a very big responsibility right now because of we, we do have some experience of some sort in the program for SIF prevention. But guess what? When we deliver this product, one of our main concerns is that people uh, or companies that haven't initiated anything, what do they tend to do? They try to take it all in. And this is one of the recommendations that is gonna come out of the, the group as uh, as well, because it, it, it's great the the, uh, the comparison or the illusion that we had in the Brad, Bradley curve is the same thing for uh, uh, when we look at companies that do not or are not in a specific zone of the curve because they didn't start that uh, program of any sort yet. So our main recommendation is that despite of the um, I mean, the appetite to to have it all in, please don't do it. Try to phase out, try to connect where your company is and what is the maturity level that your leadership is. Because depending on the situation, it will require some sort of educational practice from your health and safety groups and the highest leadership level of your organization. And eventually, it, depending if you want to take it all in and use all of the KPIs, it won't have the result that you are expecting to have. Otherwise, if you go on the step-by-step -step and phase out and acknowledge the maturity that you have and the KPIs that would be appropriate for this sort of maturity, you definitely have a, a better result from at whatever stage you would like to implement of this SAF program. This is one of the main recommendations I would have. Perfect. Thanks, Kelly. And just before we go to Mike, just a reminder, if you've got any questions for the panel, type it into the to the questions on the screen. And, and Mike, I'll let you finish with the last comment before we go to Nelson in the Q&As. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. I, I You know, I, I think Don and Kelly have brought up really strong points. But the, the, you know, the big key here is we can't do everything all at once. Pick up and pick what you're going to do first. I, I think your, uh, your points on, on where we focus and what we measure are really important and, you know, the place to start is in the field. Uh, start in the field, start getting the right questions asked, and you know, then you can start to mature into what, what both Kelly and Don were, were talking about. Kelly, from the standpoint of moving the program forward, 
and Don getting that the the kappas, you know, those actions, making sure we're really pushing them up and we're not going for the lowest common denominator. So that would be that would be my advice to the uh, to the mining community. Nelson. Excellent. So we're exactly on uh, the time here for to get into the Q and A. So before we close the webinar, we'll end with some Q and A. I've got about four questions here that have come in, um, probably five now. So I'll I'll invite the audience to send your questions in. Anything that we don't get answered in the next ten minutes or so, we will uh, circulate with the group here and uh, get answers for you folks. Uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks or so as we as we get the data from the, the webinar. I'll start with um, the first question comes in after classifying uh, an incident as an SIF or potential. Could you then further classify it as good or lucky where good is equal to we had remaining critical controls in place? Uh, does anybody want to jump on that one right now, or do I do, you, do I pick somebody? I, I, I think and, you know that that that's always possible. That's always possible to do, but I'll tell you uh, what my experience has been, uh, and 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 I've and I've helped implement programs in over 200 companies. The more binary you can keep it, the better. So it either does or doesn't have SIF potential. So it's either SIF yes or SIF no, or maybe needs more information before you say yes or no. But the more binary you can keep it, the better the success rate is going to be of your program. And I'll just sort of leave it at that. Anyone else want to add a comment there? Or the second question? Yeah, I, I, I'll add on. With Don, I, I agree because it's human nature for us to want it not to be as bad as it as it could have been, or not recognize the the potential outcome. So you know, it, it, Don's right. Yes or no. It takes the guesswork out of it, and then we uh, and then you can move forward. It's almost like getting Absolutely. up to go to the gym in the morning, right? Either you're going to do it or you're not. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You want to say something? Um, and, and Absolutely. Yeah. In, in my point of view, the binary helps a lot. Uh, what Mike is saying, we all from the group experienced some sort of, you know, uh, I, I think it's this way. I don't think it's that way. So that binary helps. But I would say that having not not only the mentality of the severity but also the likelihood because we do have already through all of sorts of uh, um, industry uh, channels uh, the amount of fatalities that we already have in our industry so unfortunately we do have lots of lessons learned and lots of likelihood in terms of history of incidents that happen that are very similar in nature so if we are going to, if you are going to create some sort of binary on what is an SIF and what it's not an SIF, we do need to consider the likelihood. So the the risk evaluation as a whole. Yeah, I'm going to move on to the next question here. So we've got a few more that just came in. So any data available on serious injury and fatality risks associated by type of equipment? such as conveyors, pumps, things like that to help raise awareness. So the, I should have put it in, is in front of that, but that's the question for the group. Is there any data available across the board that maybe this study group came together and it analyzed data or is there anything that'll be shared in the study from that perspective? Yes, uh, uh, real quickly, uh, we did do an analysis. Uh, so these, uh, so our, our partner companies, seven companies gave us uh, data and we did do an analysis of the uh, predominant SIF risk situations. Number one by far uh, was trucks, heavy equipment collisions, and rollovers. Uh, that that was the that was that was number one. Uh, not too far behind that is uh, a fall of rock uh, and uh, high wall collapses. 
uh, and uh, control of hazardous energy, uh, you know, lock, tag, and, and try. Uh, th those are the top three uh, SIF risk situations, and those three probably make up, make up around 60% uh, uh, of the total number of, of SIF risk situations. On the MSHA uh, website, there's also another analysis that, that, that keeps an, an ongoing tally of all the fatalities that they, that they study. That, that's another source of, of data for uh, the, the situations that people face. Uh, and over to the panel, too, for any other comments on the data that we analyzed. Yeah, Donna, I think from, you know, you mentioned MSHA. I would, from a scientific perspective, say that it correlates with the MSHA data but mm -hmm. it it aligns really really nicely and it's got it's got at least face validity uh i don't know if it's a statistical validity we'd have to study that a little bit more um but but yeah that they they line up pretty closely and nelson one other comment um uh, on on uh the previous question real quickly for the audience um another piece the on determining does it have sif potential or not an attribute of an organization that perhaps might be in the dependent or independent phase would be very uh, well thought out, well de well defined SIF definitions, SIF logic, SIF decision trees, and a strong education from the board of directors all the way down to the frontline supervisor employees. So when you're aligned in your organization with those tools and those metrics, it becomes very easy to say this had SIP potential or not, yes or no. And it's very black and white. It's very binary, as Don was saying. So that's one thing. If you're struggling with that, that's an area of opportunity for an organization. Okay. I want to, I'm, I'm, I don't know if we'll get to all the questions with the last three minutes, but the next one is kind of dovetails on the last question. You know, if we go back to the notion of safe production versus producing safely, you know, is there a preference there coming out of that for the, the the study group? I know that sounds almost a little pedantic with the last three minutes, but words make worlds, right? So, you know, there's a lot of talk in my organization when we we write things. You know, safe comes first. It's like a subconscious cue. So, any commentary on that from the study findings? Say Mike Duffy brought it up, so but but it but it makes sense that you know when you when you couple the words safe production, my take on that, uh Mike, is that the only way you can have production is safe production. There's 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 no other type of production possible. And and if it can't be done safely, then you can't do it. So there's a another binary like go, no go kind of a decision point is if a critical control is missing or underperforming, you have no other choice but to stop the job. Because if you proceeded, it would not meet the, the term safe production. No, exactly, Don. And, and you know, it's, it, it's, it is a catchphrase, but it, it, it truly does, you know, enunciate that the company is is looking at what the outcomes are. And you're not only looking at how many ounces, pounds, tons you produce, it's what was the cost of that production from a human toll. So that that's a you know that's that's a key metric and certainly the you know everyone is 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 looking at that but it's it's really getting the people your frontline people be they supervisors employees contractors to understand think about what you're doing and if it can't be done safely with what you have in front of you stop because pretty well every company has the means to get you what you need to perform that task safely so that's that's where that comes from and it's about getting the mindset to that point yep. okay thanks mike last quick question before we turn over to michelle to wrap up 
Dawn, when will the study be available? Regardless of where we're publishing it, what month this year will the public be able to, to reach out? Maybe that one's from Michael. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, this year, yeah, we, we do we do have our our, our next uh, study group meeting is in April uh, and I would imagine it would be a couple of months after that that we would have uh, the approvals from the members of the study team to start releasing these uh, uh, results documents excellent and with that I will thank you all for participating today I'll thank, thank the audience um, Michelle I'll turn it over to you to wrap things up Thanks, Nelson. And thanks to John and Michael, Dawn, Kelly, and Mike. What a lot of people on our panel today. <laughs> that was a really a thought-provoking discussion. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and ask that you please fill out the short survey that pops up on your screen at the close of the webinar. A link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow. Keep an eye on the CIM calendar of events at cim.org for the next Safety Share webinar. We hope to see you there. Thank you and have a good day. Take care, folks. Everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye.